Welcome to The Virtual Shift, a show looking at the seismic changes happening in healthcare with virtual care at the epicenter. Join me and my guests as we look at key cultural and policy shifts impacting how providers, payers, and patients connect, as well as how care is being reimagined both for today and the future. Hello, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm your host, Tom Foley. You can learn more about this show by visiting the program on healthcarenowradio.com, and be sure to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, at Foley Tom and the hashtag, the virtual shift. Today is a special day. It is a, a season end recap. And uh, I've invited my station manager and producer, uh, Roberta Mullen, uh, to join us on this uh, program to, again, just to review the year past and talk about the, the year coming. Uh, Roberta, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's great to be here. Awesome. So, uh, Roberta, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's been a great year. We started in uh, March of last year, just as things were accelerating in the context of uh, COVID and things of that nature. And, and we've learned a lot uh, in, in context of the overall program. And, you know, the, the show, the virtual shift is really about who are the shift makers, who are the innovators, who's really driving uh, innovation and reimagining the delivery of care ultimately to enhance uh, both the consumers, the patient's uh, engagement, as well as enhancing the services that a provider might off, uh, offer in the, in the context of extending their services into the home. Yeah, you know, when you first started and we were doing concept of the show and we were doing virtual, we, we had the word virtual, right? And I think over a year ago, it really meant something different. And not only has the shift in what we do virtually has shifted, so has your show and what you're talking about. You know, that's been the interesting thing as I've been, you know, editing and listening to it, the um, who you bring on. You're really you're really talking about the big shift. It's not just telemedicine. It's not just, uh, you know, talking to your doctor over the phone. It's a whole shift. And and you can hear it as you listen to your guests as they come on. They get it, too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe when we first started, you know, telehealth and the, the you know, the, we, we often use the word telehealth. But I, I, I I've come to the conclusion that telehealth is just video. And it's really not telling the whole story about the shift. It's really about virtual care. And when you look at all the different things that CMS is now offering through reimbursements, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring, new in 2022, and chronic care management, it really allows that provider to reinvent themselves in their overall delivery of care model. It's not just about the brick and mortar, and it's not just about virtual. It's a, it's it's how you extend both. How you how you fuse them together actually is the better way, as I think about it. The other point that you always make in your talking to your guests and everything else is this whole shift from hospital to home, the patient from hospital home. And I know you were at Hims because I saw you there, and you were at, in a booth, right? Um, I don't know how much time you got to really uh, look around or go around, but I was just talking on another show recently. We were doing a HIMSS recap, and one of my big points, I think, I had like three things that were kind of major themes there, and I really thought that the hospital to home was a big theme there this year, where it hasn't yeah, been I, before. I, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, as you know, I, uh, I'm the chief growth officer for GeneMD, so, you know, if we, 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 we talk about from the provider's office to the home, Provider's office could be the hospital and or the ambulatory setting, but it's really about the home and reimagining what that can be, right? And uh, so I would agree that uh, that is really where the market is shifting. Uh, so you can start with telehealth, but you can scale to a virtual care delivery model and, uh, and again, transform your, your entire practice. Uh, but I don't think a lot of providers – still understand the full Monty, if you will, about what is ultimately available to them. Uh, because you, you, you hear remote patient monitor, oh, I don't have time for the alerts, right? And not realizing that they can partner with someone that handles, you know, 90% of all that activity and they only get escalated those patients 
that are truly in need and need uh, a provider to uh, to provide that uh, to engage versus uh, someone that's monitoring alerts, if you will. So are reimbursements keeping up with innovation in this area? Isn't that another concern that doctors and hospitals have on this remote patient monitoring? Well, you know, in the short term, I, I look at, you know, what's what are we all talking about? We're talking about episodic care and how do we get the value? And, and I think that there's a lot of concern across uh, the provider base as I talk to them about how do I get there, right? I can't go at risk. My, you know, my financial model is about you know, maximizing visits in the office and, you know, and, and the like. But I, when I get to value, I have to take risk. And my financial model can't afford risk at the moment. So we talk about, uh, and what I try to get to in the discussions that I have on the program is this continuous care model. I personally believe that if you adopt telehealth, remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring, chronic care management, there's an influx of revenue and enhance services that you can provide without taking on any risk. So the and but I believe continuous care is the stepping stone to how to get the value-based care. So in, try, instead of trying to create this huge leap from uh, an episodic care model to a risk-based model, you the, the regulatory opportunities uh, through these funded uh, services. Uh, allow you to advance your delivery of care model, engage that patient that you need to do to get the value because you can't get the value unless the patient gets to wellness, if you will. And a continuous care model ultimately allows you to get to do that and then explore how you ultimately get to uh, to value. And what about the hospitals? When when everybody's saying it, you're we're doing hospital to home, we're moving the patient out of the hospital. How are the hospitals taking that? I mean, is that their model? Uh, well, you know, the this is where there's, uh, in my view, a a discrepancy or this uh, slow pace to take that leap. Right? There are a lot of discussions on how to make the home uh, a setting of care, whether it's hospital at home or in an ambulatory setting, and the home becomes that setting of care. You don't have to go to a brick and mortar for everything uh, that you need to see a doctor for. But the point there being is, uh, you know, hospitals, just like uh, primary care physicians, they're used to the episodic model. Hospitals, are, they're, they're, you know, one of, with all due respect to the hospitals, they're, one of their major uh, models is bed utilization. You know, a true hospital at home model empties the hospital, hypothetically, right, and, and moves right. patients to the home, how do I deliver that care? Because you know, it, it it all leads to both the consumer and the hospitals are fighting the same battle, but no one talks about the the hidden problem. Uh, and the hidden problem is my classic uh, rant about the average patient, five chronic conditions, nine different doctors, only spends fifteen hours in front of their doctors in a given year. The question is, what happens? When in that other 8,745 hours, that, that's a challenge for the ambulatory provider, in my view. The challenge overall in the industry is I got an older age or sicker population, regardless of all this technology that we've applied in, in years past, older age or sicker population, less doctors and nurses. How do I provide care in the home when I don't have the resources necessarily necessary to do that? And I think that there's, a, there's this merger, if you will, that needs this fusion that has to take place about uh, how we do that and how we ultimately and finally empower that patient to engage as opposed to being hypothetically dictated to as to what they should do and when they should do it. I love how you're, whoever you talk to and whatever you're talking about, you know, the, the bigger scope in this, those two points that you just made, older, sicker, and the time that uh, an average patient, and when you're talking about an average patient, you're talking about a Medicare patient, so that means they're over 65, correct? Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. exactly. With the five, with the five chronic, right? Um, yes. You're you're always able to bring that up at some point of the conversation, and and it and has uh, something to do with what you're talking about. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's 
Uh, and again, I don't want to, I always take, I always say, and I'm not a doctor, but I have a lot of uh, family members that are doctors and nurses and EMS uh, drivers. So I, I get healthcare. And if you've ever gone through, uh, you know, you've heard my story about my father, mm-hmm. uh, my father-in-law and, and thing with mm-hmm. um, many different conditions. But the point there being is a surgeon can fix you. A provider can only make recommendations. And when you're in the brick and mortar of a provider, if you're not going to heed the advice of your physician, and meaning uh, comply with your care plan, whether it's filling a script or diet and exercise, you will not get well. So the point there being is while I'm in front of the doctor 15 hours in a given year, that's not where wellness occurs. That's where awareness occurs. Awareness and wellness occurs in the home. So if you're not going to change your behaviors, you're not going to be compliant and persistent with your care plan, you're not going to get to wellness. And if you don't get to wellness, the doctor is never going to get the value. So it is the, it, to me, it's the fundamentals of how we, how we need to shift our thinking and in, in how we engage our patients. And they, need to, they truly need to be empowered because we don't have the resources, uh, time, money, or resources to really do it the, uh, in full with, you know, you know, can't, can't have a nurse in every home uh, every day, right? So you have to empower that patient and you have to give them the tools and, and the information uh, uh, necessary for them to advance their own cause. If you're not your own advocate, you will be very, very challenged to get to wellness. Because again, I, my mother-in-law is 84, uh, many different scenarios. And I always say, geez, if it wasn't for my wife and her sister, and and loved ones helping her and advocating for her. I just think about the folks that don't have that, and 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 that's where healthcare really fails. Uh, and because uh, it it's still a, a an effort in motion to uh, to get to a a better state of how we deliver care. So if you're just turning in. You're listening to Tom Foley, uh, host of the Virtual Shift, and today we have on the uh, program Roberta Mullen. She is the station manager and the producer of The Virtual Shift, and we're talking about uh, the season end recap. I have a question for you. So looking back on season one, what were you looking for when you were planning out who you were going to talk to? Like, what, what was your thought? Like, who did you want to talk to? Not specifically the person, but what were the conversations you wanted to have and what formed your season one? Well, you know, I always look at the virtual shift as a as a collaboration, you know, and uh, and and bringing on people, thought leaders that will that are shifting the market. And, you know, sometimes if you don't go to hymns and you don't go to uh, other healthcare conference, it's hard to get access to the, those thought leaders. And I think that uh, and my intent was to bring uh, those thought leaders to to the forefront through radio and and have just a just a general conversation about w- how they see the market what they've done to to shift uh the market and and ultimately help educate the listener on the opportunities that they can embrace to uh to to create their own shift i know you've had a uh, you had a good mix this year you, you did policy you had someone specifically from CMMI, um, right? I had C- CMMI. I had uh, also uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, HIMSS, senior vice president at HIMSS, right. uh, mm-hmm. talk about uh, regulatory uh, efforts as well. And then specifically vendor types that um, have devices in the marketplace right now that are, are remote page monitoring. Yeah, so I mean, and that's really the, the shift as well. Is that it's not just about telehealth and the, you know the virtual care scenarios that I talked about. It's you know it's the integrations that have to take place. Every patient is different. Every home is different, and being in, able to integrate really some innovative devices. And the one that I'll call out most because I think they are uh, the most innovative it has got to be a lot core, and with the Cardia e- ECG. Uh, I ju- and they were they were full disclosure they were in our hymns booth, uh, but they were in our hymns booth because they bring uh, they bring the shift, right? They uh, there's nothing easier 
in taking a six lead EKG ECG than than, than the Cardia device. Hey, shit. Uh, it's put two thumbs down, put it on your knee. I mean, if you don't bring simplicity to the market, you're, you're not going to bring results to the market. And uh, and so letting people know what's out there in innovative devices. Uh, it, it ultimately allows them to to understand, you know, why do I have this back of medical devices that I'm giving my patients to bring to their home when I can simplify that in in a few and a few very simple devices to achieve the same objective. And I remember that that was FDA approved, right? That is FDA approved, absolutely. And 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 it's not only uh, good for it, it can be prescribed as well as be in, obviously it's integrated with uh, GeneMD uh, as part of the remote patient monitoring and um, and uh, engagement uh, platform. What is the advantage of having FDA approve a device like that? You know, most people think the FDA is a, a drug thing. You know, you put a drug out on the market and the FDA mm -hmm. says it's safe. So what's the FDA's role in a device? Yeah, so it could be a medical device. That's the low bar for a device being used in a remote patient monitoring uh, uh, world. But we often look for a 510K clear device because it goes through a level of scrutiny like no other device. And, you know, you ha it's just like a drug in the fact that you have to go through clinical trials uh, and and prove its effectiveness and uh, and its measures before safety. it can be put a safety measure, yeah, mm. uh, for uh, before it gets put in front of a uh, patient. So you can wear a wellness watch and it, get, it gets you close, if you will, to your mm. to your actual readings. But an FDA 10 cleared device gets gets you much greater accuracy. And if you're really worried about measuring your wellness, you want accuracy as, as best you use you can acquire it. I think we would be a little remiss if we didn't talk about HP, your sponsor yeah. of the show, just uh, yes. to give them a little shout out. But on top of that, you had a um, reoccurring guest from HP. Tell us what you talked about with him, because those were interesting yeah. conversations. Yeah, so uh, HP Intel uh, was our sponsor, and I very much appreciate uh, their commitment. You know, when you start a program and you have zero listeners, it's a leap of faith. Uh, and, and so I really appreciate uh, the folks at HP uh, for believing in the, uh, the mission. And, uh, and now we've grown to close to 8,000 monthly listeners. So, uh, uh, I'm, and I'm very uh, proud to, uh, to have achieved that. As part of that relationship with HP, it, you know, you, you talked about medical devices. There's, there's software involved, obviously, the, the virtual care platforms that we talk about. Uh, and but there's also a platform, a hardware platform, you know, and, and what do we need to think about? It's not just about throwing a tablet out there. Right. Uh, or a, a, a computing platform. Um, but, you know, security is uh, security is important, certainly. And, and, you know, protecting the enterprise is important. And, you know, AP brings um, uh, 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 a level of. Uh, um, uh, innovation uh, to the market where they address that in the firmware of their product and in the in the in the uh, delivery of their of their boxes. I, I I always say, with all due respect, because they're one of our sponsors this year, it's more than just Intel inside. Yeah, it, it's not black boxes are not commodities uh, as much as people might think. Hey, give me an Intel chip, give me storage, give me memory, uh, give me low cost. There's more. And, uh, and I think HP brings more uh, to the table. Well, regard. they certainly bring credibility also. Certainly bring credibility. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brand, you know, and that's why, um, you know, brands matter. You know, I look at innovators and certainly there are a lot of innovators that are building their brand. And uh, but, you know, relying on established brands to help you launch is an important thing. If you have two junior brands, it's it's going to be very challenging. But if you can have a very proven brand married with a developing brand that's really shifting the market, like a GNMD, frankly, uh, you can do some great things together as as 
as is what's occurring current now. If I had to say, if someone said to me, what was your favorite episode? You know, I hate to, I hate to do that, but, and I'm not going to ask you to do it, but I'm going to just bring up one, not that it was my favorite, but very, very interesting, kind of out of the box. And, but you brought in Paul Mango and he talked about the, what was the lightning? What what was the? Yes, it was really how the federal government moved, uh, it got COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 vaccines to market. Right. It you was know, fascinating. They, they, yeah. And what I liked about it is uh, just like, uh, you know, when COVID started, you know, we would not have been as successful as we were unless CMS changed their policy. It is it is a clear and distinct experience about how policy can accelerate a market and or close down a market. And, you know, the Trump administration, and I'm not playing politics here, the Trump administration changed policy. They reacted and they made things happen, right? And that's what the beauty of it is, is that, you know, what I was trying to get out of that conversation is by change and by fo- by a focus uh, and action with intent, you can change markets and you can make things happen. It's not just, you know, the, you know, I'm a, a former wrestling coach uh, and I've officiated for 40 years, but um, the, the point I had on my team's uh, shirts one year, I can. And because when you're out there on the mat and there's two individuals, it's about I can, it's about you. It's not about mm-hmm. the team. It's about you. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and I thought that, you know, what uh, Paul was doing as leader in that charge was he had this I can attitude and it, and the team had the we can attitude to make a change and accelerate um, and bring something that wasn't in market to market in a very short period of time. It changed. They changed all the rules uh, to make something happen. And it is, again, just demonstration about how government can help us and how government can hurt us in the context of uh, what regulations they impose um, on us. Yeah. And he was very articulate about like how they started it, how they brought the, uh, the private sector in. And that was fascinating too, when they brought uh, FedEx and UPS in there and they were like kind of laughing saying, you know, no, you're, you're not going to just be disrupting. He was like calling off numbers of how many a day. (laughs) I thought that was a good, and I think on the end side too, he was very, uh, very upfront about saying when they did lessons learned at the end that there were places that they failed and they knew it. And one of them was the was what they said to the public. That was a very interesting. And again, you you might say, well, what does that have to do with with your show or whatever? But I thought it, you know, it was a great current person, honest really was in the thick of things uh, during the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's a lesson learned on I can too. Uh, and if you want to deploy a virtual care platform, there are certainly challenges, there's no doubt. But, you know, think, plan, execute are my three uh, uh, mantras on how to, how, to, how to bring something uh, to market is, is important relative to you can deploy a virtual care platform. It's not about stopping on the on the idea of oh all these alerts I can't respond right that's an inhibitor you uh, un- learning a little bit more about what the possibilities are can change your whole perspective on how to change your delivery of care model in your own practice and that's really so you know we we had a national emergency we needed something we didn't have it and they they didn't let the no be an inhibitor to the yes. And that's Mm -hmm. really what, if you're really going to reimagine the delivery of care and you're going to shift the market to Mm -hmm. a virtual care model, you can't allow the inhibitors to block you. Uh, Mm -hmm. You have to think about, okay, that might be an inhibitor. Let's not forget about it, but can we think, plan, and execute that mitigates that that inhibitor to be successful? And that's ultimately what uh, what I was trying to bring out in that discussion. Mm -hmm. It was a good one. I, we don't have much time left, but what are you planning on for season two? Well, uh, first of all, HP is going to continue to sponsor your show, so thank you. HP, yes, HP is going <laughs> to continue to sponsor the, the the show, and I do again appreciate their uh, 
their faith in the program and their their collaboration and 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 what we're doing uh, with GeneMD, frankly. And uh, so that is a great thing. And uh, and you'll hear more from uh, Jurgen uh, on the uh, on the device, and we'll do more of those uh, uh, th- those types of programs. And I will tell you just uh, out of, just out of interest, you know, all uh, all the programs, the virtual shift, his programs were one of the largest listened to programs. They were <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. when he was on. So uh, so uh, certainly more of that. But um, so you know, 2022 is I think we've turned the corner on. The idea of it's really about virtual care versus telehealth, and we're going to talk. We're going to dive a little deeper on it, the success models that folks have realized based on the deployment of a virtual care model across their community. So, Roberta, we are out of time. I really do appreciate you uh, joining the program. It was uh, it was great to uh, recap the year and and certainly talk a, a bit about. Uh, 2022 uh, in the next 12 months. So I appreciate your time and forward to having you on uh, at the end of year two. And that's great. And I want everybody to know to look for a new branding. I just saw your new imaging for the show and that will be out to start season two. Roberta, thank you again. I would like to thank the show sponsors, both HP and Intel. HP Engage long lifecycle products provide the stability, safety, and security you need, plus flexibility and performance designed for today and tomorrow. As well, Intel would like you to know we're going above and beyond together with new standards for business with the latest Intel vPro processors, delivering what IT needs for performance, security, remote manageability, and stability. And be sure to check out the program page on healthcarenowradio.com. And remember, connect or follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, at Foley Tom, and follow the show's hashtag, The Virtual Shift. I'm Tom Foley. Until the next shift.